All right, everybody, we were going to um, do something uh, fun, but we were having little issue. But I want to introduce our next session. We're going to really dig into now how AI and XR are impacting gaming design. So I want to influence the fabulous Nicole Lazaro, and it's Zio Design. Zio Design, and she's going to show you what she is up to and how all these tools that we've been looking at all afternoon now are being applied in a new direction with gaming. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicole, let's have a big hand, everybody. I will use the microphone. Good afternoon. Lovely to see everyone. So many, isn't it great to be back in person? I've been seeing so many folks. Yeah, it's just awesome. So this is a John Henry versus the AI Steam Drill. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicole Lazaro. And I am, among other things, I created the very first iPhone game, kind of got it all started, and uh, excited to be at Apple uh, next week for Monday. We'll see what happens then. And uh, my model, the four keys to fun, uh, it measure emotion on people's faces while they played games. And uh, it's used by millions of developers uh, around the world, like you know these, these folks here. Uh, and so I'm working on Follow the White Rabbit. We'll be talking a little bit about that, and then also just the broader uh, AI uh, applications. So to kick it off, I know that we've gotten uh, a lot of talk about AI. It's gotten me thinking. And new technology essentially always has you know, hopes, and it always has consequences. It's always this, you know, this mix. And what's creating all the fuss is that with AI, we have multimodal, in the very basic sense, we have multimodal inputs, but it's the multimodal outputs that are really creating a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the talk out in the, uh, out in, on the, out in the world. And uh, I think it's important to talk about both because the, the, the pluses and the minuses, because we are evolving into a new form of capitalism, uh, donut economies, stakeholder capitalism, other things. We realize that the world really is all connected. So it's very important when we talk about tech to consider both sides of the, the coin. Now, I don't know how far you folks go back, you know, uh, you know, back in the early part of the computer in computer history or information technology. Uh, but back in the day, you know, they invented this new form of information tech. You know, it was called writing. And, you know, it, uh, it would not have, uh, you know, people were up in flames about it because it would totally destroy society because we, you know, people would not have to remember anything. You know, what was that? You know, the, it would totally change, you know, cognition and, you know, we could just write it down. We wouldn't have to actually use the brain. I think we're in sort of this similar phase uh, here where we're going essentially with, uh, you know, from the Gutenberg, you know, press, you know, to other inventions like the electric motor, the personal computer. And then now we have, of course, as everyone's talking about uh, this conference, you know, the stochastic parrot. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I meant AI. And uh, AI doesn't actually understand, you know, what it's, what it's talking about or what we're using it. It's getting better, though, at convincing us that it does. And I think that's important to remember. So multimodal inputs and outputs, and now AI is getting better at tricking us into feeling that it's, um, uh, that it's something more. But really, AI is a tool that humans use. And I think that's very important to remember about this tech. That is the framing that we need. And essentially, a lot of this stuff that's amazing, as amazing as it is, it's really a web search with conversational formatting. Now, we've all seen you know, the headlines, right? And uh, this week especially, I had to redo the beginning of my talk because of it. Uh, but I think that it's, you know, we're gonna be seeing you know, a new, kind of a new, uh, a new era here. It's worrisome because, again, of the uh, our current you know, approach, you know, especially with mass layoffs happening as well, that, you know, what is it, are AI, is AI coming for, you know, for our jobs? And if we remember the Web 2.0, you know, what is the world's largest taxi company, you know, owns no cars? And then how soon, if we think about it, would be, will the world's largest companies employ no people? And that's a very different world than what we're living in today. And I think that what we can, there is stuff that we can do, you know, unless we uh, do things like create AI creating more jobs than it replaces, or that we skill up. And although AI is going to learn, master, or at least appear to master these soft skills, uh, it will, you know, the ability to use new tech is something that we can do uh, as, as humans to, to advance. 
This is not the focus of the talk, so I'm just going to throw this slide. Please you know, ask the slides later or take a picture. But here are some things that we can do as a society. Now, I want to get um, back. I think that the counter here is just holding it 20 minutes. So um, I'll uh, ad lib, <laughs> and hopefully we'll make it in on time. But we have a lot of we do have a lot of options going forward. But let's look at what AI is now and applied AI. How can we apply AI to XR game development process? Follow the White Rabbit is a uh, XR mobile game. It's an adventure you play in your real room with your real friends. Now, if we look at you know what is the AI promise, and then how close are we? How useful can it be in an actual project? Well, the uh, you know it's you know it's I think it's still often a bit off in the future. But you know, today, you know, AI does you know pretty much AI does this rather well. Okay. It helps us do. It helps us you know go forward. No, and then again, like it's really a it's really a, a, a statistic parrot. No offense to my parrot loving friends out there, by the way. Now, uh, we're looking at the uh, how many people know the the uh, American folktale of John Henry and the steam drill. So early in early America, uh, you know, there was this competition between John Henry and the steam drill. Very, very wonderful um, American folklore. We were trying to play the video earlier or audio earlier. So when I when I put this in a prompt into one of the uh, image generation engines, uh, this is what I got. Does anyone see does anyone see something that might be wrong with this image? What is it? He's white. He's white, and he's a industrialist. He's got a bow tie on most of these images. He's got on all the images. He's got a bow tie. So now that's bias. Like, what if 90% of the media is going to be generated by AI in the future? How are we going to be able to detect this? How are we going to be able to correct it? So I, as the user here, again, AI is a tool that humans use. I put in this prompt: "Black man versus steam drill," and I get this. What do people see about this image? What do people see? Yeah, right, right. So overalls, that f the the facial expressions, very old, um, very very common. Unfortunately, the way uh, blacks were represented in media, uh, a lot of different. And then, what biases do I not see? Is even more concerning for me. If I add the phrase AI, the word AI, I get a little bit more parody. Afrofuturism is coming, you know. So I getting, I'll definitely pull that. The uh, the female images, I liked a little bit, a little bit better. And then if I use Joan instead of John, I got this, which more racial diversity, or well, a little bit less racial diversity, but at least I got um, some age diversity, which is great. But this is John Henry in my mind. You know, this is, this is what I wanted to get. And as the, the prompt engineer, you know, I could create this, right? I knew how to use the tool. But not everybody is going to be, you know, that, you know, that way. So when you're thinking about developing it, and we think a lot about this with our game, is what is that role of AI and what are the new KPIs? What are those new performance indicators that we want to measure? And you know, what is our goal relative to our goal? You know, our, what, are we, what is our goal that we're trying to do? And there are very two very different, different frames. Uh, the, and it can be subtle. So this, for example, is on LinkedIn, and I really don't know. I have no idea like why they're doing this, but have people seen the collaborative articles on LinkedIn suddenly? And uh, what are they training? What are they going to do with your data? What are they, you know, are they going to, what is, are they training an AI with this, or are we just adding more content that's community generated? I don't know, and we need to know. We need to have an opt-in. We need to know what's happening with our data and um, what's, what's, what's going on. Uh, and so then John Henry, you know, misinformation is another issue. So. Uh, John Henry is not the only, uh, you know, misinformation in this product. I don't know if anyone spotted it earlier, but um, that's the actual Gutenberg press on the right. And then, of course, election season is coming up. Uh, you can actually autonomously uh, program an AI to plan its own actions to run a campaign for a fictitious can uh, candidate. And now Google search is actually indexing uh, AI-generated images higher than the uh, actual artists with uh, Johannes uh, Vermeer, Pearl with the Girl Earrings. Uh, the one on the, the left there is not the original. Uh, with that, though, I think the framing is important, and I'm more of the camp of the bicycle for the mind. That's what the computer does. That's what the information tech does, and that's what we want to, um, want to do. Remember, with the steam drill, there was still a human running it, and I think that's th these are the kind of products that we, want to, that we want to make. And in the making of a product, like a game, uh, we want to look at wh why we're using it and when in the production process. 
And it, it, the usefulness of AI that we found so far is very different depending on what stage and what applications we're, we're, we're applying the AI to. So is it for ideation? Is it for producing? And you can see that's working rather well for us. Production assets, eh, it depends. You know, some as well, some as not. And then uh, the strategic reasoning and thinking and the actual designing, it, you know, that's future AI. That's really not, that's really not here, here yet. So you want to be intentional. And then when we are um, being intentional, we want to look at uh, what's going to happen next with, the op with these opportunities. So what happened, why Web 2.0 was so successful is that the cost of distribution, uh, like put something up on YouTube, cost of distribution went to zero. With creative AI and generative AI, it's quite possible that the creation of games is going to drop to zero or near zero with the invention of, of AI. So that's going to radically change the, uh, the unit metrics and how we do business in, in the world of games. I'm not saying we're there yet, but there is that possibility. And so we see, we're going to look at three opportunities for uh, XR, generating assets, um, you know, understanding the world, and uh, in, in, game, in game mechanics. So we're getting uh, a lot of good stuff with Follow by Rabbit on, you know, the text to image outputs. It's a mystery adventure game, so we're generating a lot of clues this way. And uh, the as long as you can be, uh, you can you can work with this uh, this art assistant, you know, called in this case it's Mid Journey. Uh, then you're, you know, you can do pretty you could do pretty well. Uh, but you can see that the realism, it's very photorealism, but there's also this edge. They call it hallucinations is a common, is a common phrase now. Uh, we're leaning into that as part of the style and the aesthetic to increase the mystery. Uh, you may not, with your IP, have that, have that privilege, but that's working really, really well for us. And then uh, with uh, AI, we're also scanning the room. This is just a quick snippet. You've seen probably this kind of stuff before. But we're using AI to understand the room that you're in and then have the gameplay uh, creating, uh, being created in the, uh, in, the, in the real world. So it's you know, great on mobile XR and then even better on headset. And then when we're in the world, this is a hand and body interaction as well. So this is like the Aladdin's cave where you're gathering stuff. This is a prototype we did on Magic Leap. And you're, you know, you're going, you're going through the real, the real world. And so this is an application of AI in the game mechanic. It's mostly uh, a very sophisticated. It turns your body into the joystick. So you're no longer just pushing buttons. You're actually using, grabbing, you know, bending, stretching, working through, um, working through the cave. Haptic interaction is also something we're really into. Uh, we're going to be, we've got some really interesting, uh, a really interesting partner for that, where you can, you know, surface textures and directional force, some really cool, like you just want to feel, I just want to put my hand into the airflow and feel those eddies, right? Uh, that's what's coming with uh, the next generation of haptics. Going from, it's like going from one bit haptics to, you know, 24, 256 color haptics. Uh, we've seen a lot of text to image, but I don't know if people have seen, you know, blockade and uh, this, you can sketch it out and then it creates uh, a, a rough mesh and then it actually creates these wonderful skyboxes based on the initial drawing. And then we'll, you can go with different styling, you know, one after the other after the other. And this for a, you know, AAA game might not be the quite quality, but, you know, it's going to be pretty good for, you know, an average user. And think about what people could do with, um, you know, with that. And what people would do, there's going to be these new game mechanics, right? Where you can just, you know, call into being this world as the player, not as the, not as the game designer. And so I'm sure everyone has seen this video, uh, so we'll, we'll skip forward. But uh, you could put, you know, famous people. And then actors are already starting to rent their likenesses uh, to AI in order to be generated into a com commercial spot. Or they could be on, you know, 12 shows at once, you know, in a single day if they're renting out their likeness. Uh, looking though at the uh, real world, I thought this was a very, this is the oldest example, I believe, in the slide deck. Uh, this is from October. I had to throw everything out, uh, you know, pre like two months ago, uh, the other examples, but I kept this one because it is scanning the room. This is in VR and scanning the room and it's, re it's, a, the, it's putting on the mesh, it's retexturing the mesh live. So it's pulling, you know, visual content in and then replacing it with other stuff. And that dynamic reskinning, the dynamic real-time reskinning, very trippy and very interesting kinds of things that we're going to do. And I, th I know that we can be, we can be uh, horrified or scared or afraid of what we're losing, but we can also think, what the heck, how could that be a game mechanic? How could, what kinds of, and I, we just don't have any idea of what's, uh, of what's coming because, hey, it isn't here yet and you know, it's up to us to build it. 
Real world can also though get, uh, you know, this is the Adobe Aero and uh, Google Maps collaboration. So now we've got a, a 3D mesh of, of the event space and now you're putting in your live, your, um, your AR models and animations and stuff like that live. And the ability to do this, you know, for a location as a creator, as a, you know, as a programmer, whatever, developer is great. But then also, like, just as an attendee, it would be awesome to have this app. And then you could just, you know, graffiti the space with all of this other, other cool stuff and share, you know, share it with your friends sitting next to you at an event. And so it's not just a passive user. It's going to be actually interactive and you'll be working, you know, be working together on it. Uh, the world, the real world, though, has a, another dimension. It has time. Uh, this is something I did with the Snap AR, uh, the glasses that they have. Really, really amazing tech. And uh, this is like if it saw a mailbox, it would remind me to vote at a special election. So lots of really interesting, um, interesting applications when you're when you're merging the real life, my real life, what I my goals are, and the um, and, and the world around me. But for XR games, what we're going to look at is we're going to see this AI in the cloud. So imagine a YouTube channel or a YouTube platform or platforms actually replacing game engines. And so you may, you know, be able to, you know, go text prompt to game in the in the future. It's uh, probably the most revolutionary uh, lies, you know, revolutionizing AI impact that AI will have on uh, on games. Not here yet by any means, but that's what's going. And it's almost like if people are Ray Bradbury fans, any Ray Bradbury fans, okay? The Velt, one of my favorite stories. My first holodeck, you know, story, because it actually predates the holodeck. Uh, you go into this nursery in the Velt uh, story, and you say African savanna, you know, with lions. And if you know anything about Ray Bradbury stories, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, I'll leave it to you two uh, to find out. But we're almost at that point where we could go into that VR cave and uh, create something. But can we really get game mechanics? I think that's a very important question. And if you look at uh, like the NVIDIA announcement from I think it was two days ago, uh, here's natural language. And so if we can have the audio up for this, that'd be great. You can actually uh, talk with the, um, the AI. Hey, Jen, how are you? Unfortunately, not so good. How come? I am worried about the crime around here. It's gotten bad lately. My ramen shop got caught in the crossfire. Can I help? If you want to do something about this, I have heard rumors that the powerful crime lord Kuman Aoki is causing all sorts of chaos in the city. He may be the root of this violence. I'll talk to him. Where can I find him? I have heard he hangs out in the underground fight clubs on the city's east side. Try there. Okay, I'll go. Be careful, Kai. So it's pretty cool kind of feeling like what, what this is going to do at some point. And, uh, but in a sense, like how do you, as a game designer, how do I balance an LL, a large language model, an LLM, right? How do I, like if, if the guy just goes in, if my character, my player goes in and just orders ramen and leaves, they never got the quest. And so, or what is the interaction, you know, what is that interaction like? So we could get, we can get the start of it. And it's definitely better than, uh, you know, a dialogue maze, like I've, I've done too many of in, in games. Uh, but there is, there is some more stuff to consider. Another really sweet example is uh, Hool, I guess, Owl misspelled, there we go. But by Niantic and Eighth Wall, Liquid City and Inworld. And they've got this delightful little AR owl that comes into your space. So it comes in on a little portal. And uh, we'll talk to you about the Redwood Forest, which is outside the portal. And you can ask it questions in a much more natural, you know, natural conversation. And this natural conversation is a real game changer for games, pardon the pun there. Uh, and with this agent and casual conversation, that structure can work well. It's when the owl then has a goal for you or it's in a larger quest that, that you know, you have a lot more intricate uh, uh, game, game, game design and game mechanics. Uh, there's been talk about text to games. So this I thought was a great example of the, uh, uh, you know, text to coding games. So using ChatGPT to create, you know, code presumably and shaders and all of that to make it, uh, to make it uh, a full, a full on game. But I do have questions when I think about this is that, so it's looking like, you know, Beat Saber, but does it really play like Beat Saber? And do the things that it's not uh, rendering now, uh, the scores and that sort of thing, you know, does that, you know, pull away? I mean, is it, is it fun? Is it fun? And I don't think right now, I think we've got the ability to get, you know, to something that looks like a game, but I'm not sure we're there where we can get something that actually feels, uh, feels like a game. 
And uh, so here it's it's looking like a game, but they you know there's a lot that's missing, and I think that that's going to be a lot of the the special sauce that has to has to come through more interactions, more inter iterations. So uh, we've done a lot of work outside of image uh, generation on you know character dialoguing, uh, puzzle design, uh, narration, and other things, and uh, we definitely got this one. You know, it was a dark and stormy night. Uh, and where we found is that AI, at this generation anyway, not the saying it's not going in better, but the character, it's not really great for, for, these, for these things. You know, there's really not a good handle for game balancing, and the character dialogue does come out really flat. I get great puzzles, it's like, oh wow, those are 10 escape room puzzles, I like that. And then I ask for another 10, and it's kind of the same 10, you know, or 11, you know, just with different words. Uh, and so it's that, you know, it's that kind of, you know, kind of limitations. I, I like to think of it as this, you know, it's kind of like AI scrapes the tropes, you know, and, and formats them for you. <laughs> so if you can, you know, if you happen to hit, you know, with a prompt or something, like you hit a mother vein, a good vein out there, you might get really, really good responses. Uh, that might, if it, the content's in deep in that model, you might get uh, enough variety to actually go forward to production. But a lot of times it's like, okay, I read the story, that one paragraph once, once but then the second one it does, it's, you know, it's really not, it's really not working. Or it's, it's just, I've heard this before. And of course, hey, I'm going to get in phone raising mode as soon as our demo's done. And so I was like, oh yeah, AI text to, to pitch deck, yeah. Uh, and then, oh wow, that really did not work out. Um, although I don't know, maybe if funders will like that storyline thing, maybe maybe I should maybe I should actually test this out with some investors. But it it basically took a prompt and then you know uh, generate pulled you know images from the internet in this case. I didn't think it was very compelling uh, or you know persuasive. Uh, of course, I may be wrong because uh, I'm on the on the on the funder side, uh, fund, fundy side, sort of funder. But these are the opportunities uh, that we found really good luck with. So conceptual art, uh, code ideation, uh, ideation, not final code, you know, scraping the tropes and then, uh, and then putting them aside. And it's like, okay, that was, that was good first generation stuff. Now let's really get what we're going to actually do so that it feels fresh and new and, 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 very, and very fun. And uh, on the production side, there's this, um, uh, actually getting game mechanics that has more of this multimodal input, I think is really the holy grail on the game design side and production side. You can also, because you can create so much art, if you can get a style that's generated, that's AI generated or procedurally generated or semi-AI, semi-procedural, you can actually create a lot more art than you might be able to with that team you know, prior. So for us, there's a whole new set of game mechanics in White Rabbit that we would never be able to dream of, even if we were a AAA studio because we can just do stuff at such a, at such a scale. In, but you've, it does have to be very, it's very much tied in. And then this, uh, uh, what can happen is that the model can roll out underneath you. It can change underneath you. The AI model can roll out underneath you. And that can be a huge problem because your prompt and your approach can subtly not work. So mid-journey three to four was a big change. It's like, wow, do I try and recreate that, that texture that I'd had in three? Uh, or do I just scrap that as learning and then go with something, rock something new with mid January 4? And then, of course, five's out now was, you know, how many months did I have on that old one? <laughs> uh, this is what we're just not quite ready for. This is the AI dream or the wish list. I thought this was important to, uh, you know, so that consistent style. If you want a hero character with goggles, I've got this steampunk thing going on, forget it. You've got to have the goggles painted in afterwards because it just, you can't get that consistent if you're trying to do a whole bunch of else with the character. And then uh, these interactive experiences can be really challenging. Uh, you know, final text, don't show it to the player, <laughs> definitely not. And that getting that consistent style in canon. So if you have an IP, either branded like Star Wars or your own IP, how are you going to get a consistent, you know, use of that, you know, that character or that world or, or something like that? It's, you know, you can get, uh, you might get, you might be at Moss Eisley and have an initial conversation with the bartender that works well, but then suddenly it's ta he's talking about, you know, Goldilocks and the free Three Bears or something like that because the AI jumped um, out out of out of canon. Uh, the counter to that, of course, is personal training. So you can, as a studio, individually train an AI model so that it is canon. So you put that all in, and then you need to have the right uh, the right dials to go. But again, I think it's still pretty initial. Uh, and not um, and not completely uh, dialed in yet. And then there's also copyright ownership. There's a lot of that is a moving target right now. Uh, that's definitely changing super super fast. Um, so to wrap it up, 
these are the things that I, in when I, we also do consulting at Zio Design, and uh, these are things that I'm advising my clients in games and enterprise clients as well, is it democratizes, think about how does it democratize the creation process and how can you leverage that uh, as part of your experience? And that where, you know, is it modding, UGC, you know, creator economy? There's a wow factor, definitely, you know, and if that's all it is, a marketing piece, great. It can go off into the ether after it fizzles out. But if you're going to have an experience that people want to do again and again and again, uh, there needs to be another, other layers of engagement that are part, that are, are supported by your, uh, your AI strategy. And the small teams now have a huge AI advantage because they can go after AA or maybe even AAA in some regards, as long as it's not 3D and video. 3D and video assets are, are really pretty, um, uh, pretty basic now. And with 3D assets, it's great if you are a, a specific, you know, a specific kind of um, a very common style in games. You'll have more, again, you're hitting that mother vein. Uh, but if you're trying to do something unique or stands out in the App Store, it might be harder to get that, uh, to get that going. And here's some output tests. You know, do I want to turn the page? Do I stay engaged? Does this engage, you know, am I going to do this for more than 15 minutes? Can I balance the game mechanic or do I just have to accept what the AI gives me? So think about it with your own projects. You know, how are you uh, going to uh, use, use AI? And if you're like me, it's a very important priority for us to you know, keep AI human-centric. Uh, because again, AI is a tool for humans to use. So can't wait to see what you folks create. And thank you very much. And if you want to sign up for our um, email list, you can get that QR code.